difficulty is the you know compression volume differences the direction of the blood flow cannot be interpreted down on venography uh, but later on when duplex ultrasound has been introduced yes it became the gold standard uh, we will be looking down at the you know uh, which part has got the compression and how much the flow is there the blood flow is there and what is the diameter what is the surface what are the irregularities that have been present and this kind of valuable information will be given down by duplex ultrasound so that's the reason we considered that as a gold standard okay before yes so many books used to say that it is venography uh, because then it was only in you know uh, b mode ultrasound that has been used but uh, later on uh, you know uh, color doppler came into existence so when color doppler actually has been introduced yes color doppler became the gold standard all right what kind of a book you saw uh, venography which book was it see uh, measuring out any kind of gold standardness of a, a, a imaging modality actually depends on the sensitivity and specificities ah okay see <laughs> this book uh, generally you know has got a lot of uh, you know contradictory questions see we can't help such kind of contradiction yes if you are dealing with the questions down in radiology from this book yes uh, sometimes they might be doubtful sometimes a complete explanation so this one gave i think this one this book has got there has got an explanation in it right this book will be having an explanation with it so what kind of an explanation did they give were you looking at uh, you know uh, radiology sections or were you looking at surgery sections this question did you find it in the radiology section or the surgery section? Radiology. Okay, duplex ultrasound is the initial investigation of choice. Gold standard test is invasive venography. Major axial venous lobar limb displays. It's reliability dependent upon the skill of the user. See, uh, generally you know okay here this author actually thinks that uh, venography is not the gold standard uh, because uh, sorry he he does not think that duplex ultrasound is not the gold standard just because it requires a lot of skill so ignoring the technical errors here and interpretation errors which one actually provides you the best information the information best information will be generally produced by you know, non-invasive technique. That one is a non-invasive technique, right? Duplex ultrasound doesn't require any contrast materials. So it one is a safe one and it has got much valuable information. But uh, a, a, every author has got their own interpretation. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, yes, uh, this is what I know. It is, yes, duplex ultrasound is the first imaging modality of choice. That is correct. And it is also giving down more, uh, you know, more of uh, uh, better information because it is evaluating the flow rate. But in venography, we cannot evaluate flow rate. We can only know about, and uh, we can only know about the venous occlusion is there or not. But deep vein thrombosis generally do not necessarily mean to say that there is occlusion, right? there can be compression also there can be also you know reduction in the diameter which is happening because of these surfaces and which actually the flow changes so which study usually gives you better flow changes it is not venogram it is generally duplex and it is bedside it has got better advantages so uh, you know uh, such kind of questions are always debatable you know they actually depend upon the sensitivity and specificity. Both of them has got, uh, for example, to say uh, duplex ultrasound has got something around like uh, 98 uh, sensitivity and specificity, whereas uh, venogram has got, uh, you know, 
90% sensitivity, but 95% uh, specificity. So both of them are technically considered as the same thing. Okay, A every author has got their own opinion, but uh, you have to pray God that such kind of contradictory questions don't come in the exams. That's the best you can do. <laughs> okay, right? Uh, it usually happens. I understand that uh, condition there. But uh, generally, you know, Venogram is fairly, fairly an old technique. In India, no, we don't have better ultrasound physicians. So obviously, no, may, it cannot be interpreted. So he was considering taking down the point, the skill as the important drawback here. So that's the reason he was not taking it as a gold standard. But in modern countries, no, that doesn't happen, right? Skill is there. Technology is there, availability is there, and preparing bedside diagnosis, giving more information. But I tell you new information here, uh, MRI is generally considered down as the better investigation than all things, okay? Vascular structures are generally for DVT will be done down on MRI, but not even venogram in Western countries. It is never done on Venogram. Venogram has been an old technology right now. I think maybe he found out that question from something around like 1990s or 2000 books. So that's the reason maybe he did not even want to change that answer. Okay. Let us keep up, the, keep ourselves updated and just pray God that the examiner also knows the theory of what I have been telling you. If not, you don't have a choice. You have to just follow, go by the book, that book particularly. Okay. If you're according to the textbook, yeah, it is duplex and MRI that is standard. Venogram is a fairly old technology. Nobody uses Venograms these days. All right. Okay, somebody uh, uh, let me come down with smaller questions. Okay, uh, other smaller questions. Okay, uh, other people, what are what are your questions? I don't, I, I got only questions from two people. Jabalina was asking a fairly, a very, very interesting question. How can we actually differentiate between restrictive cardiomyopathies and constrictive pericarditis? All right. So shall we deal with that question and move on with another questions, okay? Because that is fairly a very, very, you know, big chapter to understand, but let me make it quite easy uh, way. Well, since uh, Jabalina was uh, the one who was asking this question, so she's the one who has to tell me why she actually had got a confusion with these both conditions. Why were you not able to differentiate? Maybe. Uh, is it okay if I can open down your mic? See, Miss, the situation here is okay. You are looking at a non standard textbook, okay? That one, that kind of a book is not a textbook, one thing. The other thing is that is actually a textbook for, uh, is some kind of a, you know, a notes for, uh, you know, a down writing down this FMG exam. See, you can't expect the author to know. Uh, because in India, OK, that, that textbook has been designed according to Indian standards, OK? In India, yes, we still do venography because we don't have enough technology for ultrasound. We don't have enough radiologists. Okay. And venography is fairly a technique done by a radiographic technician. Interpretation is not necessary. We just see if there is occlusion or no occlusion. That is what we think about DVT, but it is not about occlusion at all. It is all about the surfaces. It is all about the flow rates. It is all about in the modern times. Yes, you will be analyzing all these conditions, but venography generally do not provide all that information. Okay. 
So since it is based on Indian format, yes, you can choose Venography. But I don't know. I, I, I can't technically answer this question directly because I don't want to hurt any guys. Uh, the situation is that, you know, you can't take Indian people's, uh, you know, uh, complete low technology utilization and less available job doctors and call it as a gold standard uh, way for the whole world. No, maybe in India, yes, it works, but not for the whole world. Since you are writing FMG exam in India, I think you better choose Venography. But these days, yes, FMG has been improving. OK, not FMG solutions book, OK? I'm talking about the FMG standards have been improving. They have been changing a lot of lot of concepts. Uh, if that question has been asked down in the exam, I better suggest you choose only duplex. OK, investigation of choice. See, these days, uh, the terms, I'll tell you why this contradiction actually happens. In Indian textbooks, OK, let me open up uh, one thing so that you can actually understand what I'm talking about here. Just give me a minute. Uh, other people, you know, you can also, uh, if there are any Indian guys, okay, for, uh, just try to understand this concept here. How our Indian question papers are usually designed. I'll tell you uh, maybe sometimes uh, how to actually, you know, crack some kind of questions that come down like that. Uh, just give me a minute. I'll adjust my writing pad. <coughs> and then restrictive uh, pericarditis and uh, uh, con sorry, restrictive cardiomyopathies and constrictive pericarditis. It is not difficult. Okay, it is a fairly a very easy chapter. Okay, easy thing to understand. Uh, we can do it fairly in a short time. Let me give you here. Okay. Okay, can whiteboard? Yes. Okay. Right. See, uh, in most of the uh, books that uh, the book you are reading, FMG solutions or prep ladder uh, things, or if you are reading Kamal KV or any other, you know, uh, the examination books you are reading, you will be frequently, frequently listening to some terms which is actually called as the drug of choice, investigation of choice, okay? First line drug, first line drug, second line drug, or second line investigation or second line modality, okay? You can also see it that way. And then gold standard. See, these are the terms generally actually are coined. They are made just because of examination purposes, nothing else. They generally do not make any sense in real practice. Uh, you can actually, whenever you see actually a term as a drug of choice, let me give you an example, okay? Let us say, uh, let us take a clinical condition like, uh, you know, typhoid fever, which is fairly common down in India. Uh, what is the drug of choice? Okay, what is the uh, drug that you actually give in that one? Typhoid treatment, okay, I'll tell you the answers. Okay, don't worry to beat your brain with that one. Okay, generally typhoid fever is uh, caused by salmonella typhi, which will be treated down with the third generation cephalosporins. No matter what. Okay, but let us say third generation cephalosporins are the one that is given. Now we have plenty of drugs in third generation cephalosporins, right? Cephexime, cefuroxime, ceftriaxone, okay? Something like this. When we have millions of drugs in the same class of that, uh, you know, that group, whatever the group of drugs you are looking at, generally you have to choose one drug from it, right? I, I, when I'm saying a broad 
bird like okay third generation cephalosporins are actually given in the treatment of typhoid fever if i say it that way it means to say a doctor has got an open choice to choose from any of them right say furoxyme or cefixime or ceftriaxone uh, anything right they can actually choose any of the drug he has an open choice but out of them which one is the best so that one will become the drug of choice okay best one so right now the first line drug will be third generation cephalosporins the answer to that question will be third generation cephalosporins the second line drug here actually in case of typhoid fever generally we'll be considering about alternate therapy we call it as okay let us say if there is a patient who has got a hypersensitivity to cephalosporins what is the next drug you can generally give down to that patient that kind of invest uh, that kind of drug here is actually fluoroquinolones okay so out of fluoroquinolones okay let us say in that one which is the drug of choice Again, which one is the best out of fluoroquinolones? Okay, we have got plenty of fluoroquinolones. We have got uh, fluoxacin, we have got ciprofloxacin, we have got levofloxacin, okay, we have got gatifloxacin, moxifloxacin. Okay, which one out of them is the best one? The best one is ciprofloxacin. So drug of choice from fluoroquinolones in second line is, again, ciprofloxacin. Did you understand the difference? What exactly is this one? Why they actually coin out a term like this? Yes. Okay. So whenever you have a thing, but but I tell you, in real practice, in real practice, nobody gives ciprofloxacin to treat typhoid fever these days, because the best second line of drug, the best alternate, that it is actually the best adjuvant. Okay, best adjuvant drug in the treatment, a complete therapeutic. Uh, value is actually done by a combination of ceftriaxone plus azithromycin. In case of typhoid fever, this is the standard prescription worldwide. Things have been changed. Okay, before people used to call ceftriaxone or the other one are the best best drugs. No, today the standard drug combination has to be given that standard drug combination is always ceftriaxone and along with azithromycin no matter which country it is okay so such thing is actually called as a gold standard did you understand okay this kind of terms you usually see in indian exams in world no in world we have only two things investigation of choice and gold standard only two terms are there in world exams usmle and other things they will be generally asking only about investigation of choice which means to say the first line whenever a patient comes down to you in an op clinic or an ip clinic okay the first line what would you do that is the first line for example to say whenever a patient is suspected with a dopamine thrombosis comes down to you what will you do the first thing what will you do you will be doing the best standard test oh sorry you will be doing the best uh, you know uh, a kind of an investigation which is quite cheaper and beneficial and fast so ultrasound gold standard yes again ultrasound but because venography has got a contraindication depending upon the uh, sensitivity to contrast materials. So ultrasound is fairly, has got no such kind of restrictions. So both of them became ultrasound. Such kind of questions, you might be also looking at breast cancer as well. They might be asking, okay, what is the investigation of choice? Are the gold standard for, uh, you know, uh, like, uh, what do you say, for breast cancer? What is the investigation? Okay, the breast cancer investigation, yes, it is ultrasound, but gold standard is mammography. Okay, in the world, in the world, but in India, we generally don't do mammography. We only have ultrasound. So in India, we generally say ultrasound is the gold standard. So there is a difference. People has to get updated, but fairly many of these examination books 
they don't update it that way. Uh, but, but I better suggest you actually follow the standard textbook. Okay. And uh, let us say another example uh, in India for the diagnosis of appendicitis, nobody uses uh, CT scan. Everybody uses ultrasound. And it is considered down as the gold standard in India. But well, CECT is the gold standard because it has got 99% sensitivity and 100% specificity. Approximately, almost. Ultrasound, no, it did not have that much. Okay, so it actually depends on the sensitivities and specificities. Uh, whenever you have such kind of a questions, I think maybe in the same book, you have another question, which is related to the respiratory system, I'll tell you. What is the gold standard test? Gold standard test for pulmonary embolism. Okay, gold standard test for pulmonary embolism. Anybody answer? Gold standard test for pulmonary embolism. Angio. Angio. No, it is not angio. It is contrast enhanced CT of the chest. Gold standard, contrast enhanced TT of the chest. But in India, yes, what you are calling that angio is actually called as pulmonary angiography. Yes, pulmonary angiography. Pulmonary angiography, we no longer do it. Pulmonary angiography, we no longer do it. But I tell you, if you have been looking down in the old textbooks, the same question, if you are looking down in the surgery or medicine classes, the gold standard test will be calling down as ventilation and perfusion scan. People will be also writing down this answer as ventilation and perfusion scan because the surgeons and uh, the internal medical specialist actually thinks that, uh, okay, pulmonary embolism, embolism is the one that is actually a perfusion disorder. Okay, so ventilation affected by the amount of perfusion. Okay, so V by Q scan is the one is the gold standard according to them. But right now, all of them have been proven wrong. All of them have been proven wrong. CECT of the chest, okay, which is actually done down as MSCT or dual CT. MSCT or dual CT is considered as the gold standard. Before pulmonary angiogram, for pulmonary angiogram is a conventional radiographic technique. It is more like an X-ray. But CET, CECT is a slicing scan and it will be done down as spiral and it will be done down as real functional dynamic imaging, right? I told you this morning as well. So in the modern times in 2020, CECT of the chest is called as the gold standard. V by Q scan is not the gold standard of pulmonary embolism. Pulmonary angiography is also not gold standard. Okay, but I'm sorry to say most of these doctors, they don't update them. Okay. So think wise and answer that question. See, uh, I think, yeah, you have fairly brought up a very, very good uh, uh, topic because, you know, I know, uh, have you by, have you guys been, you know, watching the videos of crep ladder and FMG solutions or other other classes, missed classes or something, something? Have you been going on through that online classes? Yes or no? Right? Somebody, maybe yes. Yes, Debalina has been reading FMG solutions, yes. And, uh, you know, if you have been reading them or if you have been watching those videos, Generally, you know, it is about the typical Indian setups. Uh, so such kind of questions uh, will not be actually accepted down in the world. Uh, it is actually only for the Indian setups. So I think it is better. And most of those questions, what you see in your those books 
are generally, you know, from old question papers, let us say 1997 AIMS paper, 2000 AIMS paper, 2005 AIMS paper, yeah, something like 50 years ago, 20 years ago, they have been getting only old question, repeating, repeating, repeating question, but just change the options. And fairly, you know, they won't actually change uh, the concept. They will be giving down the same thing, which means to say the doctor who actually prepared that question did not update himself in 2020. So that's the reason these books all publicize them as the same answer, old answers itself. OK, and even in other uh, ladder, other things also, you must be seeing them in the same kind of pattern. But there are a lot of contradictory questions like that, but I better suggest you since you are studying in an international university, better you follow the world standard, okay? You will come off, you will come off this uh, confusion later on when you actually join some kind of a coaching center. But I completely disagree with that one because, uh, you know, yeah, I have some kind of a reluctancy whenever, uh, even when I was following those classes before, uh, and when I'm trying to prepare for the better uh, postgraduate exams or something like that. Yes, I used to have the fairly the same kind of problem. It always happens. So uh, I think your problem is solved, right? Okay, let's get to constrictive pericarditis and restrictive uh, diseases, okay? See, there are two types of uh, diseases, which is actually uh, not causing the heart to have good contraction and relaxation okay contraction and relaxation are the two things right so if this one is completely gone okay there is no contraction there is no relaxation okay so tell me what kind of a disease can actually cause the disability of the contraction and the disability of the relaxation or if you know something, okay, you tell me what it exactly is the disease that actually has got, uh, you know, uh, what is the ability of the heart to cause this contraction or relaxation, which is the one that is responsible for it? Let us say if it is the sinuarticular node and the avian nodes, yes, they give out the conduction, but even if they have been giving out enough conductions also, okay, even if they have been giving enough conductions also, the muscle, if the muscle is not working properly, yes, there will be a problem with the contraction and relaxation, right? Yes or no? So which one has got a direct, which one has got a direct relation down to the cardiac function? Okay, it has got a direct relation to the cardiac function and such kind of diseases which actually directly affect the cardiac function due to the involvement of cardiac muscle, myocardial muscle are called as restrictive cardiomyopathies. Okay. They are called as restrictive cardiomyopathies. Is this clear? First thing, it has to be related down to the cardiac muscles, okay? And the inability of the heart to contract or relax. So cardiac function thereby will be affected. So when we are trying to understand the cardiac function, what is the things that we are actually trying to look we are going to look at the cardiac output. We are going to look at the preload. We are going to look at the afterload. We are going to look at the end diastolic volume, right? Yes or no? Because these are the ones that are dependent on conditions like isovolumetric contraction, right? Isovolumetric contraction. Isovolumetric contractions. And they are also dependent on the isovolumetric relaxation, isovolumetric relaxation. Now, you tell me what are the diseases will usually have, 
what are those diseases usually will have the problems with cardiac output preload after load and diastolic volume or any kind of thing that is actually influencing the isovolumetric contractions and relaxations what are those conditions can somebody tell me what are those names of these diseases Did you understand the concept? If it is contraction and relaxation that has been affected and there is a direct influence on to the cardiac function, okay, what are those uh, diseases will actually, that one will show up a direct influence on these parameters? Any ideas? Were you guys able to follow me? Okay, 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 right. The answer to that question is actually your conditions of all walls, your conditions of all hypertrophic diseases, congestive heart failures, myocardial infarctions, mitral stenosis, all kind of valvular diseases, okay? Let us say it as valvular heart diseases, okay? Now, these are the one will eventually make the heart size go bigger so that's the reason we call it as cardio myopathy okay we call it as cardio myopathy and now what actually happens is that where in these diseases yes the myocardial muscle okay the myocardial muscles will usually become thickened Oh, sorry usually become rigid okay they usually become rigid in restrictive cardiomyopathies the cardiac muscle cardiac muscle becomes rigid so there are a lot of uh, you know conditions which are actually uh, affecting this one lot of conditions okay uh, i will not go into the details of those conditions but still which is actually affecting down the stretching capacity and the filling capacity. Stretching capacity and the filling capacity of the heart. So, we in radiology, generally what we usually do is that, yes, uh, okay, I, I, I will answer that question. Okay, just wait. Uh, so all the conditions, all the chamberal hypertrophies are generally considered down as restrictive, okay, cardiomyopathies. They are called as restrictive cardiomyopathies. Understand here one thing, let us say if there is, okay, because when, when okay, let me, uh, so that you can actually, to understand this condition better, do you want me to answer this question in physiology or do you want to ask, answer this question in radiology? In radiology, it's fairly the simple answer. You just look at which chamber is enlarged, which valve has been involved, okay? The other thing, restrict to pericarditis. Uh, pericarditis generally is outside the cardiac muscle, so that is where you are looking at the posterior aspect of the pericardium, right? Along the left atrium, right? Along the left ventricle and the left atrium. Yes, that is the way, place where you are looking for the fluid collections. But this one is the problem that is present down in the chambers of the heart where you were actually looking down in the interventricular septum or the and thickness of the chamber, right? So generally they become rigid this kind of restrictive cardiomyopathy and constrictive pericarditis are usually coined these terms in the basis of pathology observations, okay? It is not radiological names. It is not. If, if, you ha if I have to answer this question in radiology, these are not classified. This kind of names, restrictive cardiomyopathies, 
okay our constrictive pericarditis are no longer used because we call them as single diseases like chamber enlargements okay chamber enlargement and pericardial diseases we classified them in radiology as pericardial diseases and chamber enlargement diseases only that one and we generally don't give these terms restrictive cardiomyopathies or constrictive pericarditis we no longer use these names it is actually the classification the term has been given that way because on the basis of pathological observation made okay so what actually is the one exactly see what exactly is the one uh, what exactly is the one that is actually making down this one here in cardiomyopathic diseases the heart wall becomes rigid but it is thickened down in the constrictive pericarditis okay that is the only difference and in radiology chamber enlargements hypertrophy has to be evaluated and then we actually the in the other side you actually look down for the effusions that is surrounding down the heart okay i think maybe your answer has been completed now did you understand or you don't understand or you want me to go down for specific radiographic features as well yes right where the pericardium is fibrosed and thickened you call it as constrictive pericarditis here restrictive cardiomyopathic the isometric volumic contractions and relaxations is directly affecting the end diastolic volume and preload okay end diastolic volume and preload and it is being restricted due to the relaxation of the heart so that's the reason we call it as restrictive cardiomyopathy a enlarged heart that is restricting down the blood flow okay the supply of the blood is that's the reason it is a pathological observation so we used to call them as restrictive cardiomyopathies but in radiology we don't call them as that way we call them as chamber enlargements or pericardial diseases okay only two things i guess if you wanted to look at down the radiographic features i think yes it has been divided right single chamber enlargements and rest pericardial diseases has been dealt as two separate sections in the practical slides so if you want me to explain that one yes i will explain that one if not i will leave it out here what about other guys did you guys understand what i have been talking about here yes what about other guys in radiology generally you won't be getting down questions a lot of this one okay no theoretical questions will be coming down you will be getting only image based questions okay or maybe you can get down a four marks question like which is related down to pericardial effusion other than this you need not worry about anything in radiology okay if in this subject don't worry about that topic here but in medicine yes you may be have to learn a lot but then since this is not a medical class so that's the reason i'm trying to you know ignore that one right okay aman was asking some other questions here an alternative means of lymphatic spread is obstruction of central lymphatics usually in the hyla with retrograde dissemination through the lymphatics in the lungs so what's your problem with this aman what's your problem with this questions okay all the questions what's your problem with this what don't you understand these things here okay meanwhile aman are you here
Let's, yeah, I guess he's not here, I guess. Yes, that's true. Okay, fine. So let me come down to your answer, Reshma. Uh, you have been asking normally the athletes have comparatively larger heart size. Okay, how is it not pathological in term, in long term? Hmm. Okay, what do you think? So we got two clinical conditions here. You're talking an athlet. Okay, you have talking about an athlet and you are talking about the pathology. Let us say a left ventricular hypertrophy, guys, and an athlete with exercise capacity, right? Also, both of them has left ventricular hypertrophy. And you are asking why this condition is normal for this guy and why it is abnormal for this guy. Isn't that Reshma? Yes. And you are also asking if this one will become down to this one later on in the later stages of life. Yes or no? Yes. Okay. Mm. If your question, if you have interpreted your question like this, you tell me the answer. Do you think it will happen or it won't happen? It will. What are the conditions that actually, actually, uh, you know, influences this one? Okay. Now I tell you one thing. Let me ask you two questions. What is angina? Okay. What is stable angina and unstable angina? What is stable angina and unstable angina? Stable angina is the one that is actually, you know, the heart uh, that, uh, what do you say? The angina that has been present and has been there for prolonged periods of time, right? That is stable angina. Unstable angina, sorry, uh, it is getting relieved upon rest, so which is actually called as a stable angina. Unstable angina is okay that a angina pectoris that has not been relieved down with rest. So, so which one will have unstable angina in these both individuals? Which one do you think will have unstable angina? In both of these guys, which one will have better, uh, you know, dealing? Answer? See, which one will have stable angina? Is it the athlete or the pathological person? Which one will have? Unstable angina, which one will have stable angina? That is my question. Okay. No, you see, athlete in the sense, okay, stable angina, that is okay unstable angina so both of them will be having but generally you see here i tell you one thing yes when the athletes actually started training on the first time okay let us say if you have started running today or if you started weightlifting today what you usually do is that okay the heart has to compensate for the oxygen supply right oxygen demand that is there in your muscles right an athlete is a one frequent exerciser, okay? The heart has to pump enough blood and oxygen and nutrients to the muscle tissues which have been working on. Let us say if he's a sprinter, yes, it has to be supplied down to the calf muscles. Okay, let us say if he's a weightlifter, yes, it has to be supplied down to the, you know, bicep, triceps, and every other organ that has been moving on, right? So the oxygen demand and the blood supply nutrient demand has been increased. So how will the uh, heart actually compensate with it? The heart will compensate with it by increasing the heart rate. 
okay increasing the heart rate if i increasing heart rate what actually happens yes cardiac output also increases if i increase the cardiac output what actually happens the bp also rises right if the bp also has been raised the respiration also increased right this is the physiological right so to compensate all these things what the heart will do they will become hypertrophied but we actually do this one as a gradual thing which actually you see here i think uh, you know how kind of a, what kind of a smooth muscle okay if there is somebody who is actually working out in the gym will can understand here what actually you require for it we actually require lactic acid we require lactic acid okay which is a dangerous substance okay and you will be having creatinine both of them are actually controlling this one right myoglobin okay and then troponin are the one are all these one are actually required right which actually suggests that there if the heart has one uh, hypertrophy because these are all the ones that are the end products of your hypertrophied cardiac muscle any kind of smooth muscle not only this one any kind of smooth muscle will actually give out this one so in this person in in the athlete what actually happens is that this will eventually it will cause the wearing and tearing actual wearing and tearing of the cardiac muscle so which one is actually called the microfilaments of the heart okay the microfilaments of the heart they break and they become fractured which one will be replaced by the these enzymes to become bigger so such thing is actually called as hypertrophy so which is actually called as exercise induced hypertrophy okay but these people over a over a sm smaller period of times so any athlete will generally will not be doing out exercise for a long time he will be trained right so such people will be able to manage the cardiac outputs they will be able to manage even though if there is a hypertrophy in their hearts but a pathological condition is technically not like that a pathological condition if we are talking about left ventricular hypertrophy in particular it is actually the only that thing what is the reason behind hypertrophy this hypertrophy is actually behind of atherosclerosis because certain oxygen demand is not being made down for some areas of the heart okay some part of the heart has not been getting down enough oxygen yes or no only some part a little area let us say this one only a little part of the cardiac muscle is not getting down enough oxygen and perfusion so what actually happens to do this one becomes actually compensated by other increasing things but still is there any occlusion has been removed here no but is there any occlusion in this guy no occlusion yes so this patient will even if the oxygen has been supplied as well but the heart is unable to recover to it so they will go down into the releasing down the end products in high amounts okay and these are all dangerous substances like i said so that's the reason in the diagnosis of you know hypertrophic disorders or cardiomyopathies okay troponin markers myoglobin markers are the one that are actually used for diagnostic purposes right did you understand this one right now there is a difference between those two conditions one person will usually have you can add the because there is a restriction in the blood flow even though hypertrophy is unable to compensate and the heart is unable to adapt because of that restriction but in the other condition it does not happen okay so which one will have a direct high rise of troponin markers is it the athlete or is it the uh, uh, pathological guy real pathological guy it will be the pathological guy but the question the second question to here is that okay will the other guy will the athlete eventually develop down the left cardiac hypertrophy left ventricular hypertrophy eventually later on in his life on a long term 
The answer could be yes, the answer could be no, depending upon his lifestyle. Risk factors, okay, depending upon his risk factors. If the patient has had a history of hypertension, if the patient had a history of atherosclerosis and something like genetic predisposition, and he's falling down, has obesity or something, something like that, generally, yes, he may develop. But most of the exercises has got a dominance of it, okay? So which is actually called as cardio exercise capacity okay they will have cardio exercise capacity to the best so generally you know i think most of the people who actually exercise every day they know about this cardio right though most of the times we actually say they prescribe these cardio exercises for most of the people right so they will eventually will not develop uh, a pathological condition yes their size may be increased but maybe they eventually won't be able to develop because they have been doing it gradually. And the other thing is that while the diagnosis of hypertrophies, you see here, what is the best uh, investigation to find out the exercise capacity of an individual and differentiation of stable enzyme and unstable enzyme? How can you differentiate between them? Anybody? What is the test? done for differentiation of stable enzyme and stable enzyme or what is the evidence that you always ask for in history what is that you ask always for in history think and say What do you ask? You guys with me? Yeah, why don't you answer? Tell me, how will you, how will actually do it? Stable enzyme when you get enzyme symptoms during, okay. Okay, right. No, my question was not that. My question is that how are you going to investigate or how are you going to interrogate this person if he is having stable enzyme or unstable enzyme? And what is the test that you actually do it to prove this? No, ECG, no, I'm looking for hypertrophies or not. See, the question I'm going to ask is that is there any kind of a difficulty of breathing or if there is any uh you know hard uh, chest pain that is coming when you are actually doing normal activity what is the normal activity you do you walk you climb the stairs you do your daily course right and excitation stress all these conditions will you have this one and is it getting better due to rest or is it being aggravated that is the first question you will ask right if there is a chest pain anybody kind of a patient that is coming down to you with the chest pain what is the question that you ask okay what kind of difficulty do you usually have when you are doing your normal activities right right now if he says yes we are going to choose that one as unstable enzyme. And if he says no, we're going to choose this one as stable enzyme, right? Okay. So unstable enzyme generally do not do, uh, do not go away while you are resting. Stable enzyme generally go away when you are resting. So now to do this, we are going to do a test that is actually called as a treadmill exercise capacity testing treadmill capacitance testing okay it is called as treadmill capacity capacitance testing ever heard of this one or you can also call it as ex exercise tolerance okay cardiac exercise tolerance also you call that with that name have you ever heard this one treadmill testing yes no
No? Okay. Tread, you know treadmill, right? People go to gym, I guess, right? People will be running on, on a rubber platform, right? That is what treadmill. But what we do in a hospital is that we will connect an ECG to it. As simple as that. We will connect an ECG to treadmill. Uh, we connect an ECG just leads to the patient. And then we ask the patient to run. Or sometimes if the person is old enough, we don't ask the person to run, but we will be asking, we will be having a table that is called as churning table, okay? Or rotating table or churning table, we call it as, okay? And we ask the patient to do something like cycle down, cycle down with the hands, okay? There will be two pedals. I think if you have, you, you since you are guys in China, you know that there will be a lot of exercising uh, things down within our campus or somewhere, somewhere, right? Where the people can actually rotate things down with their hands and they can actually, you know, uh, make up the push ups and pull ups and something that there's like, if you have been going down to the parks, you have been seeing a lot of metallic devices, right? Those all devices, that, that's the same thing like the churning table, okay? And the more the patient actually pedals on the churning table or the more the patient runs down on the treadmill and you see any kind of elevations, ST elevations on the lead three, two, and we go. When you are actually doing that one, yes, you actually call that the patient is might be suffering from myocardial infarction and maybe having a heart attack and call this one as unstable enzyme. Clear? Yes. ST elevation. Okay, you call it as the STEMI. You call it as STEMI and NSTEMI. Okay, ST elevation myocardial infarction and non ST segmental elevation myocardial infarction. Two kinds of conditions. Okay, all of them will be coming down under restrictive cardiomyopathic diseases. Okay. All of them will be coming down into the same category, right? So exercise capacitance, that is what we do. So the answer to that question is no. The people will generally will not develop because the athletes will have good cardio exercise capacity. So while on the exercise capacity intestines, they will be actually doing in slow things. So any kind of a patient any kind of a patient with a suspected myocardial infarction, what is the suggestion that is given by the doctor? Walk every day. Yes or no? Walking is a good exercise. Yes or no? Jogging, brisk walking is the best exercise, right? So that is why we are doing. It is not about being there. It is actually inducing their exercise capacity to the limits. We are giving them smaller and smaller doses so that they can actually tolerate the exercise influence. Right? Okay. Is this is so your doubt is cleared now, Reshma? Perfect. This is not a radiology question, but fairly it's okay. Yeah, fine. Don't worry about that. Aman, uh, yes. Uh, why, why, why do you have that kind of questions? Okay, please tell me. What don't you understand in the questions that you have posted? Yeah, see, okay, that, that's a fairly, uh, a very good question, okay? Um, I'll tell you one thing, okay? Since you guys did not get down into deeper things of uh, diagnostics and you did not start internal medicine, see, some kind of terms may be difficult for you to understand, okay? i tell you what exactly you're talking about, okay? Whenever you have a diagnosis, okay? whenever you have a diagnosis, there will be symptoms, right? There will be some symptoms and some patterns, okay? Which is present, right? 
Now, what actually you do is that whenever you are trying to make a differential diagnosis, whenever you are trying to make a differential diagnosis in that particular patient, trying to see and cover the all the basis of that one, generally we do two things that is actually called as association or inclusion. And the second thing we are actually going to do differentiation and or exclusion. Okay. This is the pattern a doctor generally works whenever you are actually trying to make a diagnosis based on the symptoms and patterns coming. Okay, we actually have to do the differential diagnosis. When you are trying to do the differential diagnosis, we see which patterns and symptoms are associated with the disease. Based on our knowledge of interpretation, we try to include them into the disease which we are thinking. And we will try to see if which of the symptoms can be differentiated and which one does not cause this disease. We try to differentiate and try to find an explanation for that presence of that symptom. So we exclude that disease. Or we exclude such kind of a symptom or exclude such kind of a pattern. OK, so diagnosis of exclusion is the one that you are removing based on the symptoms or the observations you have made. For example, to say, let me talk in radiological terms. Um, if you have seen an, you know, a mildly kinked diaphragm in a patient with the cardiac hypertrophy, do you think that this kinked diaphragm, okay, curved diaphragm, okay, some a diaphragm, something like this, okay, okay, you have seen a kinked diaphragm as an observation, and do you think that okay, will the person has the person obviously has a myocardial infarction or congestive heart failure, let us say. If he has that one, do you think that this kinking of the diaphragm, this observation you made, is related down to CHF or not? Do you think so? Yes or no? No? So now let me tell you one thing. What is the disease that causes the next question that has to come down to your mind is that okay, what is the disease that causes kinking of the diaphragm? Okay, kinking of the diaphragm is generally normal variant. Uh, it can happen down in atelectasis and other conditions as well. Okay, or it can be you know completely you know some some kind of a muscular disorders also will actually give it right. Contractility problems also will give it. Now, do you think that this contractility problem or this kinking disease is actually going to cause CHF? Will it cause or will it not cause? Answer is yes, no, not cause. So remove this diagnosis. So this became a diagnosis of exclusion. Got it? Which disease you are trying to in which disease you are trying to put down into your diagnostic condition, which disease has been associated, which diseases are not associated. So this is actually a process of, you know, diagnosis, differential diagnosis. OK, I think uh, generally your diagnostics teacher will teach you this one, but uh, generally nobody teaches, uh, teaches you like a flow chart. OK, this one I'm talking about the flow chart here. What I made here is something more of a flow chart, but uh, generally Teachers won't teach it this way, uh, but it is actually adapted by the student. Uh, the student actually is the one who has to do it. OK. Uh, so better you practice them, which disease, which symptoms causes, which systematic problems or which disease is related down to which symptoms, which disease can have which symptoms and out of which symptoms are primary symptoms, secondary symptoms and you know, most notable symptoms and most non notable symptoms. For example, to say whenever I ask, maybe I think the case that what we have dealt today, let us say what is the most important symptom that comes down in typhoid? Or let us say what is the most important symptom that comes down in tuberculosis? 
it is cuff productive cuff right productive cuff is the most important symptom right but it's not fever right fever can be have uh, happen in lot of patients so which one are you including why are you including only cuff why are you removing the fever and other things that actually becomes the diagnosis of exclusion got it so in that part i think others right now it makes sense look what is the differentiating between the metastatic spread okay and lymphatic spread and uh, non lymphatic spread okay i think right now why we are thinking about metastasis canon ball metastasis and other things i think right now that solution has to be uh, uh you you should find out that solution by yourselves right now i think that sentences will become much more easier by now right okay let us get into the next one ct scans may demonstrate speculation or irregularity in the lung nodule that may not be apparent on the conventional radiographs okay uh what don't you understand i guess you don't understand the term speculation here right yes you don't understand the term speculation or is it just you don't understand that whole sentence yet speculations generally you see here whenever there is a nodule okay whenever there is a nodule it can have connective tissues it can have connections down to the other places and they will be actually having cartilages or fibrosis or anything okay it is a connective tissue which is letting it attach to the surrounding viscera this one is speculation that's it okay so Speculation or tiny structures, depending on the type of mass that is present or depending upon the pathological change that might be happening. So they will not be visible on conventional radiograph. That's it. Speculations are just nothing but the extra growths that has happening around a nodule. Okay. Right. If it is relating down to the pleura, we call it as pleural tail. If it is happening down and connection down with the interstitium, we call it as speculations. Or if it is happening, we call them as reticulations as well. Okay, speculations and reticulations, all of them are almost the same. All right, so that's it. Then, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is considered as the end stage disease along the spectrum of interstitial pneumonias. Okay, so you don't understand it how. I guess right. You don't know. You don't. Uh, you don't know why it is actually the end stage. Why is idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is considered as the end stage? Mm. The answer to this question is actually not present down in radiology. It is present down in pathology. Okay. If you want me to explain that one, yes, I will explain. Okay. Right. See, uh, there are, you know, like uh, any kind of an inflammation, okay, any kind of an inflammation. Uh, no, that, that, that is where you are actually, you know, trying to misunderstand here. Any kind of inflammation will eventually has got some kind of response, right, which can be happening because of reversible cell injury. Okay, reversible cell injury and non-reversible cell injury. Yes or no? If you can remember that one, right? Okay, reversible cell injury. What is the first sign that you can see in a reversible cell injury? If you can remember your pathological classes, you should be able to answer this one. Okay, it is the cellular swelling, cellular swelling and damage of the chromosomes. Yes or no? Right? No, it's not no scar formation. Non-reversible cell injury, yes, it will be going down into a condition called as necrosis and apoptosis. Yes? Right? 
Now, let us come down to our statement and say, okay, what is actually saying down that, okay, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. What is the pathological change that happens in most of the necrotic conditions? It will eventually come down to a healing mechanism while this damage of the chromosomes is happening. Right? It will go down from reversible change to non-reversible change if the stimulus is more. Yes. Okay. If the stimulus is less, yes, after cellular swelling, after all the features of inflammation. Okay, there are five features of inflammation, right? Kellar, Delor, something like Telor, right? Okay, five five features of inflammation. Now, what actually happens is that okay, if it is having the stimulus is continuous, okay, what happens? It will eventually go down into non-reversible cell injury. But if it is reversible cell injury, yes, this one heals by repairing its chromosomes, which has and has happened. So now, generally, it may reverse back into that one, or it may change down its cell lineage, which eventually one epithelium becomes some other epithelium. Okay, for example, to say Barrett's esophagus, actually columnar epithelium is actually uh, sorry, stratified columnar epithelium, right? Metaplasia that is actually happening down in Barrett's esophagus, right? The squamous uh, columnar epithelium. Uh, you know, yeah, squamous epithelium is converted down into columnar epithelium. That is what actually happening down in uh, uh, Barrett's esophagus, right? So that is actually the in, uh, inflammation. Now, what actually happened there one? Yes, it is eventually causing the fibrosis. Yes, true. The healing mechanism, okay, this is all talking about the healing here. But if this one has not been healed, we actually call it, and if it has been mutated, we eventually call it as a carcinoma, right? Yes or no? So now, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is such kind of a disease which actually do not have any particular reason why the pulmonary uh, interstitium is actually getting fibrosed. So, all the interstitial pneumonias generally, eventually, it is getting some kind of an inflammation response. And they will be responding by formation of granulomas. Okay, they will be formating granulomas, either liquefactive necrosis or caseous necrosis as the pathological changes. Okay, they will be giving down liquefactive necrosis granulomas. And how do they heal? they heal by fibrosis. Right now, I guess it has become more clear. Yes, so that's the reason. The end stage, what is the final stage? That's the reason I think you see here, uh, maybe in tuberculosis also, in the radiographic features of tuberculosis also, the first thing we are going to find out is a GONS complex, which is a granuloma formation. But Rankis complex or the, uh, you know, Rankis complex or the primary complex is the one that is healed, which is calcification. Yes, end stage is always calcification and fibrosis and other things, right? Liquefactive necrosis generally, yes, will have fibrosis. Caseous necrosis will generally form calcification, which means to say it is telling me a direct evidence of the pathophysiological status. Yes or no? Right, but you in generally idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, yes, the patient will not be. Ha it is the end stage, and where there is complete non-reversible injury, and which will completely restrict the movements, which is actually con that condition what we call it as ARTS. Okay, acute respiratory distress syndrome, right, and we also call it as SARS. Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, SARS, okay? Both of them are characteristic features. So that is just some kind of a response that is given by that one. So that's it. Then the first line, I think, what is, what, what, what is wrong with the first line? I think there is nothing there. I, what, what don't you understand in dissemination through lymphatics or lungs? What, what, what don't you understand there? Spread? What do you mean spread? No, lymphatic spread is nothing but this is, they are talking about invasion and metastasis. Okay, invasion in the sense, local invasion, metastasis in the sense, distance metastasis. Okay, 
So mm. lymphatic spread means to say distribution, distribution, retrograde dissemination, okay? Retrograde in the sense, okay, going down in reverse order, okay, Be going backwards. Dissemination is nothing but an inflammatory response, okay? Yeah, ulta, right? Reshma is telling correct, okay? Retrograde means to say it is going down in reverse order. Dissemination is an inflammatory response, okay? That's it. Uh, not inflammatory response, okay? Response to the disease, pathophysiological change to the disease, right? Dissemination is actually, you know, accumulation of some substances, right? Metastatic contents, okay, metastatic products, finally we call them as that way, okay. So that's it, I guess, right, now it's understood. Let me give you a little bit of idea about uh, what we were talking about this uh, uh, Cartagena syndrome. I think maybe better you can, you know, write down if you have a, a thing. Let me talk about two conditions so that you can actually understand. This evidence actually comes down from uh, basic physiology. I think if you, I, I guess you haven't learned about this, but let me make it clear for once for all. Right? The situation is okay. Let's say here, uh, all our conducting airways. Okay, all our conducting airways. Maybe you can take a note of this one. All our conducting airways are lined by pseudo stratified columnar epithelium. Okay, pseudo stratified columnar epithelium, okay, pseudostratified columnar epithelium, then generally these are like cilia, okay, these are like cilia, now, oh, sorry, cilia, okay, now actually this one actually they are happening because of a thing that is called as dynean movement, okay. Any kind of inflammatory response coming down to the lungs is actually prevented by the dynean movement, okay, that is present down. Now, this one is the main factor that actually has to clear this sputum, which is actually called as expectoration, okay? Now, we will think about actually you know, they will actually have a synchronized movement like this, synchronized movement like this, and they will redirect the things down into nasopharynx so that it can be gone. So that is the reason what we actually see as the nasal waste. Um, in simple terms, okay, we call it as this one. You, I guess you know this term, boogers, right? all the waste materials will be redirected down as nasal waste, right? Now, the situation is that in condition of cystic fibrosis, okay, in condition of cystic fibrosis, there will be immotile cilia, okay? Immotile cilia, which will cause thick sputum production, okay? Thick sputum production, which will cause thick mu mucus uh, production due to a defect in the CTFR gene. Okay, a problem is present down in the CTFR gene, which actually works by closing the chloride channels. Okay, which will be working by closing down the chloride channels. Now, then what actually do is that we treat it by chloride ion opening channels okay that is the treatment for this one so cystic fibrosis is a clinical condition where there will be immotile cilia which produces thick sputum due to the defect that is present down in the ctfr gene that eventually causes closing of the chloride ion channels on the other side, there is a condition that is called as Carta Jenner syndrome. Okay, Carta Jenner syndrome, which one is actually happens down in the rotation, uh, which has got the rotation of the cilia. Okay, cilia actually causes 
the rotation during embryonic life okay during the embryonic life cilia are the one that are responsible for rotation of the structures okay whenever actually uh, i think you know uh, about how these structures are formed and how they are rotated from the nasopharyngeal fa uh, arches right have you ever heard this one or no yes no you know nasopharyngeal arches have you ever heard of this term yes right but uh, actually that that is the place where actually cilia actually uh, you know do that one actually most of the contents of the mediastinum will be rotated when they are formed by the production by this actually the cilia the same thing the dynian okay that's the responsible factor there now what happens in cartagener syndrome is that you know this cilia movement is gone okay there will be restricted cilia movement okay and as a result the patient will have all systematic conditions especially like sinusitis okay sinusitis and will be having bronchiectasis bronchiectasis is nothing but the permanent dilatation of the bronchuses and he is also having situs inversus along with along with okay along with okay this is the symbol for with along with as you know spermia asthenospermia in the sense the sperms that does not move immotile sperms okay and bronchiectasis can also be figured down as cystic fibrosis in these patients okay so the patient will be having sinusitis the patient will be having sinusitis bronchiectasis or cystic fibrosis like changes and situs inversus as well okay so such kind of condition is actually called as carta genus syndrome okay get it carta genus syndrome is generally we are talking only about in radiology just because he, the patient has sinusitis bronchiectasis and situs inversus okay that's it other than that nothing else there is importance or there is nothing much evidence to learn down in radiology okay i guess right now that has cleared down the evidence actually comes down from the physiology not uh, from you know uh, radiology differentiation actually will be done by the physiological theories okay that's it okay what any other doubts see uh, you guys are getting you know pathological questions and physiological questions yes i appreciate it but uh, you know that may pull the radiology topic uh, you know a little bit slower so well uh, let us try to stick down to the topic of radiology mostly okay i can understand because your basics may not be technically very strong uh, because of various reasons but still uh yes if you have a questions like this one uh better we will do it only on our free time okay not during exactly during the class sessions right uh it doesn't necessarily mean to say i won't answer your questions yes i will answer each one of your questions but uh, that might take the topic you know a long explanation because you will be learning about all these explanations later on in internal medicine but uh, generally you need not learn in internal medicine when your basic is quite strong okay so uh, i don't know how actually i should suggest you with this one what i can better suggest you is only you just read so jabalina i think uh, what is was your answer down to restrict to pericarditis and constrict to pericarditis has been cleared yes okay Reshma, so uh, is your question cleared as well? Okay. Mm. 
See, it doesn't actually make it useless. Okay, it doesn't actually make it useless. It actually, you know, restricts its function. There will be a loss of function. You see here, okay, that's a very interesting question. Actually, I should have covered that one before. What are the signs of inflammation? Can somebody tell me what are the five signs of inflammation? Fast, that's just one line answer, okay. Man, don't use normal terms, use technical scientific terms, okay? What is rubber? Swelling. What is pallor? Okay, loss of redness or loss of color, okay? Delor, redness. Calor, increase in, in temperature. What is the new sign? Yes, functio, lacia, right? These are the products of inflammation. So that is your answer, loss of function. But it doesn't necessarily mean to say that there is useless, just a little bit loss of function. The loss of function intensity depends on the intensity of inflammation stimulus. Okay. Yes, Reshma. Did it clear? They will restrict uh, some kind of function, but they don't eventually become useless. Okay. So complete uh, eventual. Uh, Ah, okay, so you want me to tell down that one is actually happening down in relation to cirrhosis. Yes, you're asking me to explain this one in relation to cirrhosis. Well, your answer don't lie in radiology. Your answer again lies in physiology and pathology. Okay, if you guys want to listen, yes, I can tell it. See, you will be learning about this theory. You will be learning about this theory in internal medicine or surgery, but I don't know later on, okay? You will be learning in the future. You are so curious to learn it right now itself, okay? Okay, okay, I will teach you. I will teach you. Just give me five minutes. Okay. You wanted to learn in relation. You see here, you are not making me a radiologist teacher. You are making me some other teacher right now. People will cry, okay? They say that, okay, most of my classes are completely in internal medicine, less of radiology. What should I tell, huh? Because I know I appreciate you guys get such kind of questions. So what can I do? <laughs> it, it, it is interesting, but it is you're wasting your time, okay? Okay. Right, I, before we actually get down into, you know, uh, something uh, that is related down to the pathophysiological mechanism cirrhosis, there are two things that you need to understand, okay? Uh, it is completely, you know, bigger level for you. It is, com it comes down in fourth year uh, classes for you, okay? You still have one year. Mm, okay, fine, let's, let's. Now let me make it more easy for you, okay? See here, whenever uh, we have, uh, you know, the, uh, what do you say, this uh, liver, okay? Liver actually has got hepatoblasts. Liver is actually developed from hepatoblasts, right? And it will is the one that is actually forming the hepatocytes right it is the one that is actually forming down from the hepatocytes and they will be forming cholangiocytes right now two hepatocytes coming together okay in the microstructure okay when down to the microstructure when you are pulling down into the microstructure you have a thing that is actually called as 
you know peri sinusoidal space okay peri sinusoidal space okay which is something like this okay let us say these are the hepatic cells okay hepatocytes okay let us say these are the hepatocytes here okay and we have the hepatic stellate cells here hepatic stellate cells here so this one is the sinusoid okay this one is the space of sinusoid okay i guess you know it in histology class yes no you will understand why i'm talking about histology before i talk about cirrhosis okay you will understand just give me a little bit of time okay now what actually happens down this is that okay this is the place for actually metastatic changes metastatic changes to happen in most of the times yes the sinusoidal space is the one that is actually responsible for metastatic changes that is happening in any kind of liver disease okay now what actually the changes actually the stellate cells do okay the stellate cells do actually is they get down into converted down as a myofibroblasts okay they converted down into myofibroblasts and they will start depositing collagen okay they will start depositing collagen in where in this sinusoid space okay they will start depositing collagen in sinusoid space now which one is actually the reason behind your portal venous hypertension atherosclerosis is the one that is actually causing because of the atherosclerotic plaques right lipid plaques right the same thing if it is happening down in the veins and if it is happening particularly in case of hepatic sinusoids if it is happening down in the hepatic blood vessels it is the collagen deposition that is happening so that is the reason behind portal venous hypertension what is the component of collagen it is albumin so this one rises direct factor why albumin is considered down because it is direct related to these things right so that's the reason we are considering down it as a better factor in declaring down the hepatic uh, function yes or no right now while you understand this theory is this concept this clear here until here is it clear yes no yes guys is it clear okay now let us learn about something related down to anatomy okay there is a thing that is always called as a portal triad right there is a thing that is called as a portal triad what are the components of portal triad we saw this morning it is hepatic artery it is the portal vein and the bile duct yes or no okay it is the portal uh, hepatic artery portal vein and the bile duct okay now let us see it in some kind of a different ideology let us divide them into like this okay let us say there is this hepatic vein okay uh, uh, let us say this one is the hepatic vein okay now this one is the sinusoid thing something like this okay i'm trying there is another hepatic vein okay in between them you will be having hepatocytes right like this okay let us say something like this central hepatic vein every hepatocyte has got a central hepatic vein yes yes or no there is a blood vessel in between every cell right particularly in this one now what actually happens is that there the space that is actually present in between and here is the portal triad that you actually see in between them is the portal triad you actually have it this is the portal triad okay in between every hepatic cells this is the portal triad you have it here so now there are three zones which actually divides down it into three zones okay something like this one this zone number one 
zone number two, okay, zone number two and zone number three, okay, zone number one, zone number two and zone number three, okay. Now, what actually happens is that, okay, in any kind of congestion, which one is being influenced? What is congestion? What is congestion? Is it the bigger arteries or the smaller arteries? Okay, bigger blood vessels or the smaller blood vessels? Or is it the anastomosis or the uh, other things? In the smaller one and it is happening at the anastomosis. So don't you think that this is the anastomosis here, right? If this is the anastomosis here, any kind of a chronic, chronic venous, congestion okay any kind of a chronic venous congestion type of you know a stimulus will actually cause a lot of you know changes of the cytochromes and actually in the cytochromes cytochromes and the glutathione's that are influenced in the zone number 3 Okay, they will bring about changes down in the cytochromes and glutathione in the zone number three. Which one eventually is causing the portal venous hypertension or it is causing ischemia, okay, or it is also causing thrombosis. This is causing thrombosis, okay or congestion, the first thing actually congestion happens. So this one either will cause portal heaviness hypertension, then to ischemia and then to thrombosis eventually. So which will eventually lead down to, okay, which will eventually lead down to failure. Okay, which will eventually lead down to failure. This is the mechanism that is actually behind that is present behind NSAID is poisoning. NSAID is paracetamol like drugs, okay, will eventually give down a condition called as hepatic toxicity, right? Destruction of the hepatic uh, uh, function, right? Destruction of the hepatic cells is the main important characteristic feature, the most important side effect of the, uh, you know, like, uh, paracetamol and other kind of drugs, right? Yes, did you know that? Yes, no? Okay, NSAID is drugs like paracetamol if taken down in higher doses and for longer periods of times, diclofenac, acyclofenac, hydrocoxib, silicoxib, they will be causing hepatotoxicity and renal toxicity, destruction of the liver and destruction of the kidneys. Okay, that is the side effect. Okay, now, what happens in case of alcoholism is that exactly it is forming down the same things, okay? Is that concept clear, whatever I just told you before? Is it clear, that one there? Did you understand that? Fair enough, right? Right now, you are calling them as two changes, okay? In case of alcoholic, in case of alcoholic liver disease, Okay, what actually happens is that the first response that is actually being formation of this, you know, collagen, uh, formation of the cytochromes and glutathione's increase in the, you know, the uh, proteins of the liver, increase in the proteins of the liver. So what you actually condition that call it as steatosis. Okay, due to the presence of ethanol, okay, due to the presence of ethanol, what actually happens is that the problem is going to happen down in the zones. So, which is actually called as micro vesicular change. Okay, which will be actually responding by depositing globulin proteins, which is technically you can also call it as fat droplets okay fat droplets globulin proteins okay are deposited down then 
it will go down to inflammatory condition that is called as alcoholic hepatitis okay which is again microvascular itself but in higher changes smaller area this one it becomes uh, the generalized uh, liver as a whole right now the response to this one will become localized more which actually starts to produce okay this one is localized in a small region let us say more and more alcohol has been given this one in the general liver as a whole okay here the liver as a whole but this one will actually start to localize its things and eventually it gets completely inflamed when it will inflame it will next go down into a condition called as hepatic fibrosis okay and this one is actually macrovesicular which is actually happening according to the changes in the portal triad and hepatic sinusitis okay that's what it is there so this one becomes macrovascular or vesicular okay then from fibrosis it will go down to a condition that is called as cirrhosis which one is healed right now which one is both the micronodular changes and macronodular changes is this clear is this pathology uh, pathophysiological process clear okay the first thing is steatosis which is happening down as a whole lung, uh, liver as a whole then which will be actually depositing of the fat globulars right then it will actually go down into alcoholic hepatitis condition which is again a microvesicular change which is actually causing the congestion of the one okay less uh, there is no any kind of enough blood circulation or the uh, metabolism of the liver happening so which actually starts down as the localizing then it actually eventually heals which becomes the macrovesicular change and it becomes down the fibrosis when after the fibrosis actually heals it actually becomes more and more nodules more alcohol is being taken more localized reaction is going to happen and they become both smaller smaller nodules as first which is actually called as the millet liver which is also called as millet liver okay the millet liver cirrhosis is generally looked like as a smaller smaller dots right i think if you can remember the images in your pathology books you can know the how to differentiate between normal surface of the liver is smooth but an alcoholic cirrhosis person's uh, surface is rough right yes do you remember that image yes no right so what actually happens is that right now they become both micronodular to macronodular changes and this one will eventually develop down as hcc hepatocellular carcinoma okay this one is nothing but you are finally you will get down a lesion that is called as a big thing that you can see on a ct something like this let us say this is the liver and you can see this is a small big nodule it becomes a big mass like structure and hypodensities in between them right heterogeneous densities are present between them are fatty liver changes in the surrounding areas because there is a lot of edema okay all of them is happening so in cirrhosis stages only yeah it was uh, yeah exactly in cirrhosis change is only that there is no going back right because it is a non reversible change okay yes so from the two evidences okay we came to know that actually it is happening down exactly yes the liver also cannot regenerate yes that is true but actually you see here i tell you like before i told you it actually depends on the amount of alcohol that the person has been consuming right it one actually dependent on the alcohol amounts the person has been consuming and depends on the frequency right uh if i have to go deeper i also have to teach you about the types of alcohols and how much percentages of alcohol is there and what one causes most damage let us not get down into that one <laughs> but uh, still you know microvesicular change let us say it which one started down as smaller smaller areas first becomes bigger bigger areas next 
and eventually became bigger bigger nodules smaller smaller nodules next and became bigger bigger nodules next and finally became a hepatocellular carcinoma right so when microvesicular changes are there the deposition of the liver enzymes is actually being uh, changed so that's the reason in case of a fatty liver changes you will not be seeing any kind of variation alt and ast might be normal in those patients but in an a hepatocellular carcinoma patient or a liver cirrhotic patient you will be seeing that alt and ast ratio is worse so this one is the highest parameter the ratio of the you know the alt and ast ratio is generally uh, is the one that is actually uh, directly related down to this one then at the same kind of another conditions like uh, you know pancreatitis and other conditions you will have bilirubin contents also being raised direct bilirubin indirect bilirubin both of them will raise and also at the same time you will have amylase lipase secretin all other contents also will be rising right so in pancreatitis which one will be doing it will be actually amylase and lipase okay gold standard for pancreatic function but for hepatic function it will be alt and alt ratio but for it case of jaundice it will be bilirubin and particularly in bilirubin what kind of bilirubin it is direct bilirubin okay right yes So is your doubt clear? It could I I could have answered that one in one line. Yes, fibrosis is healing and there is no reverse. But still, I think since you guys wanted to know the complete mechanism, I thought you I got your evidences from basic physiology and uh, you know pathology. Okay. Didn't you learn pathophysiology? I guess you learned right. They didn't teach you this one. then you forgot or it was not clear then okay so is it clear now did you understand now it will be much more clearer when you get down into fourth year and fifth year of medicines okay don't worry it will be much more deeper there are a lot of theories which is related down to this one I did not even talk the protective factors and regeneration process of the liver. That is making another big class, okay? Right? So, is your doubt clear? Right, don't worry. Yeah, sure. Any any other doubts? I guess we got to take a rest for now, okay? Right? So, I guess uh, that's it for the day. Man, what we thought of doing car cardiovascular system, you know, uh, we got individual doubts and we are moving on. Uh, better, let me try to plan on the cardiovascular system, okay? Uh, and most probably while we are, uh, meanwhile, you guys also read, try to read your uh, cardiovascular system practical slides and uh, gastrointestinal practical slides. Other than that, we don't have anything, okay? Right? So I guess that's it. So we'll take a leave, I guess. Right, okay, okay. Right, fine, see you, see you guys, bye-bye.